Another just atrocious penalty. The Raiders and the Chiefs are football versions of the Hatfields and McCoys. So these two teams have been playing each other twice a year since 1960. If there's bad blood in one game, it's going to fester next time and then next year and then the next time next year. Clear as day that he rips the helmet right off. This is the reason why you hate him. This is what we're going to do. We're going to bury him. No matter what the records are, that game is going to be intense and it's going to come down to the wire. It's the teams you love, the rivals you hate, and the stories you'll never forget. Told from a different perspective, through the camera lens. Highlighting the artistry of the still photograph, FSN lets the witnesses to history tell the tales and bring the drama in focus. When the schedule came out, you looked at when the Chiefs were going to play the Raiders six months in advance. To me, it's black holes and fans and screaming coaches. It looks like the end of the world by the time the kickoff starts. There are guys dressed with makeup and spikes, and you can always count on an extra squad car, too, to be in the parking lot to clean up the mess afterward. It's Raider Week, and that's different than any week in the season. If you win Raider Week, you're doing all right. When I first came to Oakland, I didn't really understand the rivalry. It's something that drives so much emotion through you because you just want to shut these people up. It's serious hatred from the time you land, the time you get off the bus and go to your hotel room. It is a nasty thing. And those people in the Midwest in Kansas City, they're nice people. Except for one time a year, that's when the Raiders come to town. Their battles are legendary, bred of jealousy and contempt and nurtured into full-blown hatred. The Oakland Raiders and the Kansas City Chiefs have waged wildcat war for over 40 years. Well, the rivalry started in, in the AFL. It's rooted as deep as it can be with that. The AFL were these eight franchises, mostly frustrated owners who couldn't get into the NFL. The Raiders were kind of a late add-on, and they were a doormat in the early years of the AFL when the Chiefs were in Dallas as the Dallas Texans, and the Chiefs moved to Kansas City about the time an assistant coach named Al Davis took command of the Oakland Raiders. General manager and head coach Al Davis epitomized the Raider mystique. He was a hustler from Brooklyn. If Al Davis came along today, he would star in The Sopranos. I mean, he was that kind of guy. Watch your back, Al Davis is around. He has this image in Kansas City that's probably mythical, a Darth Vader-like, creepy guy that wears silver and black jumpsuits. And for years there was talk that he would put bounties on Chiefs players so that his Oakland guys would go get him in a game. Davis didn't care how you played the game as long as you win. The famous mantra, just win, baby. I think the way he sort of inflamed the rivalry is the way he treated the people that were on the opposing sideline. There was a reason why, somewhere down the line, somewhere in history, why these people derived such a hate for the Oakland Raiders. If Al Davis wore the black hat, Chiefs owner Lamar Hunt sported the white. Lamar Hunt is congenial. He's classy. He is one of the originals. When you meet him, you feel like you're in the presence of some great president. If you look at those two organizations, they're so diametrically opposed. You've got the Chiefs, who are the most collegiate of the NFL organizations. They couldn't have facial hair. They wore ties. And the Raiders pretty much, they were the rebels. They did and dressed and looked the way they wanted. But they became the two best teams out of that league. The Raiders built their team to beat the Chiefs. Al Davis had this mantra that in order to get to the championship game, you have to build your team to win the division. It was all pretty simple. Whoever won the Western Division was going to probably uh, win the AFL. From 1966 to 1969, the Raiders dominated the Chiefs, winning six out of eight games. But in the 1969 AFL championship game, the Chiefs had their chance for revenge. Back to throw, La Monica, he is jacked. Did he get free by Aaron Brown? Led by MVP quarterback Daryl LaMonica, the Raiders had won both regular season games and were favored to advance to the Super Bowl. The great thing about that game was that the Raiders came to the stadium with their bags packed to go to New Orleans. 
and the Chiefs found out about it before the game. The Chiefs saw those bags packed, and they were incensed. The Raiders were already making their plans for New Orleans and hadn't played the game yet. They fully expected to win, you know, and they should have expected to win because they kind of owned the Chiefs. The Chiefs only beat them once between 67 and 69. With a stifling defense led by Aaron Brown and Emmett Thomas, the Chiefs shut down the Raiders' highly touted offense. Monica will throw one deep for Warren Wells. It's intercepted the 20 by Emmett Thomas. Winning the game 17-7. The Chiefs took it to them, and the Chiefs won the AFL championship. When they were leaving, all the Raiders, they, they had all their suitcases. They were had to take them back home after the game. The Inspired Chiefs would go on to beat the Vikings 23-7 in Super Bowl IV. And that AFL championship was basically the last AFL game ever played, and then the merger took effect the following year. That's really where some bad blood first began. Davidson comes in after Dawson is down, spears him in the back. Wasn't it beautiful? When the AFL merged into the NFL in 1970, both the Oakland Raiders and Kansas City Chiefs were placed in the AFC West. There, they would continue to battle twice a year. With more at stake than ever, hostilities intensify. Guys that have only played for the Chiefs, they hate the Raiders. That's what they were taught, and I'm sure it was the same way with the Raiders. It wasn't unusual for the Chiefs and Raiders to have fisticuffs all through the years. Tempers worsened with each fiery meeting. With two hard-nosed defenses squaring off, it was only a matter of time before it turned violent. Ben Davidson for the Raiders and Buck Buchanan for the Chiefs. No other teams in the NFL had guys like these two guys. They were so big and strong and dominant as far as jamming up the line and rushing the passer. They would beat each other up and try everything under the sun to gain an advantage. And a lot of those advantages were late hits. Wasn't it beautiful? The eruption finally occurred in their first meeting of the 1970 season. At three and three, the Chiefs were desperate. They needed a win at home to give them any chance at the conference crown. The winner of the game was going to be in first place. The loser was going to drop out. This was about midway through the season. The Chiefs are leading the Raiders by three, have the ball in the final minutes. The Chiefs needed a first down to run out the clock, and Lenny Dawson ran a bootleg. Len Dawson scrambles for a 19-yard gain, which would have sewed up the game because the Raiders are out of timeout. Right at the end of the play, Davidson comes in after Dawson is down, spears him in the back. And before a flag could even be thrown, if a flag was going to be thrown, here comes Otis Taylor protecting his quarterback, and he went after Ben Davidson. They got into a fight. Nobody was going to do that to the Chiefs quarterback, and especially Ben Davidson of the Raiders. Otis Taylor took exception to me spearing his quarterback when he was on the ground and came and got me around the head. We ended up in a big pile, and actually I was in the safest place on the field. I was buried under a pile of Chiefs. The officials huddled for a long, 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 long time. Had no idea what to call on it. I think they were really lost. Today, that would have been one of those post-possession fouls. Well, they flagged Davidson for the spear, Taylor for unsportsmanlike conduct, offsetting penalties, so the Chiefs, who had that third and 19, had to replay the down. They didn't convert that third down, so they had a punt. And George planned to kick the long field goal. We tied the game. And there was no overtime back then in the regular season, so the game finished in a tie, and the Raiders won the AFC West by that one game. That seemed to be my defining moment in the NFL, is jumping on Lenny Dawson. And I guess it's not a great thing to be remembered for, but on the other hand, uh, it's great to be remembered. Coming up next, a legend switches sides. When you're that good a player, you should get a pass. The last place you'd expect Marcus Allen to play would be for the Chiefs. From 
1974 to 1988, the Raiders beat the Chiefs 20 of 29 times. Led by Hall of Famers Fred Boletnikoff, Jim Otto, and Willie Brown, the Raiders won Super Bowls in 1977 and 1981. Marcus Allen would lead them to a third Super Bowl title in 1984. Envious of the Raiders' success, Chiefs owner Lamar Hunt went in search of a head coach. He wanted a man who would not just beat the Raiders, he wanted someone who hated them. When Marty Schottenheimer and Carl Peterson took over the Chiefs in 1989, Marty turned Raiders week into his own personal hell week. And he let the Chiefs players know that we don't respect the Raiders for the way they do business. They are out there on a limb. They don't put the league first. They put the Raiders first. Marty likes to whack the Raiders. He doesn't like to beat them. He likes to whack them. In his first four seasons at the helm, Schottenheimer posted a solid 6-2 and two record against the Raiders. He owned the Raiders. When they played the Raiders, they won. He just beat them year after year after year. He beat them in Kansas City. He beat them in L.A. and Oakland. He had their number. It was funny to me. It was unusual to me because you had never seen, or you hardly seen on the professional level, someone so passionate about disliking another team or another organization. But that's how Marty Schottenheimer was and we knew that we were going to have our hands full. That's a guy that got it. He understood that it was important to beat the Raiders, and he'd go in that locker room and say to those players, it's Raiders week. We're going to get those guys. Marty Schottenheimer may have turned the tide, but it was a stunning Raider defection that changed the rivalry forever. Running back Marcus Allen was the pride of Raider Nation. He rushed for over 4,000 yards and 40 touchdowns in his first four seasons and was named MVP of Super Bowl 17. By 1992, however, Al Davis had relegated his most famous player to the bench. The prevailing theory and the most logical theory is that Marcus became the face of the Raiders in Los Angeles, and he was the most popular athlete, and Al was no longer the face of the Raiders, it was Marcus. Al Davis doesn't covet stars. You know, he likes great players, but he doesn't like anybody to be bigger than the team. Apparently Al Davis decided Marcus Allen was done, and stuck him on the bench, and uh, didn't want him anymore. People just could not understand how you could freeze out a potential Hall of Fame and an ultimate Hall of Fame player like Marcus Allen. I mean, he won the Super Bowl with one of the most memorable runs you'll ever see in Super Bowl history. And Super Bowl heroes should be treated different. When you're that good a player, you, you should get a pass. You should be treated with a little bit more deference than Al Davis treated Marcus Allen. In 1987, Al Davis drafted two-sport star Bo Jackson to step in as the Raiders' starting halfback. This is Al Davis' kind of football player. Al Davis loves size and he loves speed. Well, Bo Jackson, I mean, my God, this was like the Terminator, you know, coming in as a halfback. But when he came in, it was kind of the end for Marcus Allen. The interesting thing was, this was 1993, first year free agency in the NFL. The Chiefs decided to take advantage of the league's new free agent landscape. They had already traded for quarterback Joe Montana to run their new West Coast offense. And after the 92 season, when Marcus Allen's contract with the Raiders expired, the Chiefs signed him to a three-year deal. Marty Schottenheimer hates the Raiders. And for them to sign Marcus, for Marcus to come on board and play so well, especially against the Raiders, was a thumb in the eye of Al Davis. When Marcus Allen came to Kansas City, I, I thought, well, you, maybe he is past his prime. I watched him one game, I was like, why isn't he still in a Raider uniform? Marcus Allen over the top, five to the Touchdown, Kansas City. They used him so effectively, they took advantage of his strengths. Allen proved his worth. In Kansas City, he would pass the 10,000 yard and 100 career TD marks, always saving his best performances for the team that had discarded him. Marcus Allen had to look at every opportunity to play the Raiders as payback time. Just payback's a bitch. And I'm gonna go in and get Al Davis and show him I had no business on the bench. Every time they played the Raiders, I think he looked forward to it because he had a bad taste in his mouth about the way he was treated there. He wanted to prove that, hey, you let something good get away. I think everybody involved realized from the Oakland side that was probably a mistake to, to let him go or at least let him go to Kansas City. In his perfect world, it would have all worked out in Oakland with the Raiders, but it wasn't a perfect world. And if he had to go anywhere, I think this was, what, this was as good a place any for him because he could play against them a couple times a year and maybe rub their noses in it. 
Coming up next, an eye for an eye. To have Elvis put in was a real slap in the face. Slap in the face to Rich. He always had a chip on his shoulder. He always felt like he was unappreciated. energized offense, the Chiefs dominated the Raiders through the 1990s. But in 1996, quarterback by Montana's replacement Steve Bono, the Chiefs finished a disappointing 9-7 and seven and failed to make the playoffs for the first time in seven years. Instead of turning the reins over to beloved backup Rich Gannon, the Chiefs acquired young 49ers quarterback Elvis Gerbach as their long-term solution. In 96, Bono was having some problems. And Rich was your typical backup quarterback. He was always, in the fans' eyes, you know, the people's choice. Rich Gannon was really overlooked here. He, they just didn't take him seriously as a starting quarterback. Every guy on the Chiefs loved Rich Gannon, and they wanted him to be their quarterback. And for some reason, the Chiefs organization, uh, they, they kind of missed the boat on him. And that's when the Chiefs signed Elvis Gerbach to a, a big free agent contract in 1997, figuring Gannon was pigeonholed as the relief pitcher. The Chiefs decide, well, we like you, Rich, but we like Elvis Gerbach a lot more, so he's going to be our guy. So Gerbach in 97 gets him off to a great start. They were like 9-1 and one when he hurt his shoulder. And Gannon came in, held the fort. The Chiefs went 13-3. and three. Gerbach had missed four or five games during that 13-3 and three run. And the Chiefs made the decision to bring Gerbach back for the playoff game against the Denver Broncos. Down 14-10 to Denver with 4.04 to go. Gerbach attempted to inspire a drive into the waning seconds. When his goal line pass fell incomplete, so did the Chiefs' playoff hopes. Chiefs fans were left wondering if Gannon might have fared better. Every man in that locker room wanted Rich Gannon to be quarterback. And to have Elvis put in was a real slap in the face to Rich. He was never respected as a player. And so he always had a chip on his shoulder. He always felt like he was unappreciated. In February of 1999, Al Davis and newly appointed head coach John Gruden courted Gannon and signed him to a four-year, $16 million contract. Gannon made an immediate impact on his new teammates. The one thing he impressed upon the Raiders was they hate us. They say we're going to quit, and let's show these guys we're not going to be quitters. Rich Gannon told a great story. The first year after he played for the Raiders, Marty Schottenheimer used to paint the picture of, the, of what the Raiders were like for so many years, and you just had it in your head. You were brainwashed that this place was evil, and it was insane, and no one in the right mind would ever want to play here. And you come here, and it's just like any other place. He comes to the Raiders, and he's finally home. When John Gruden brought Rich Gannon to the Oakland Raiders, he made him the starter from day one. You're not backing up anybody, you're here to be the starter. And I think Rich took that as a personal challenge for him to go out there and play his absolute best football. Gannon got immediate revenge in January of 2000. The Raiders visited Kansas City in the final game of the regular season. The Chiefs sat at nine and six. A win meant a playoff berth, a loss by the Chiefs, and their season was over. There's so many ramifications that are riding on this game, not only for us in the building momentum and gaining confidence, but for this Kansas City team. They've got to win to get in the playoffs. Now the heated rivalry is on. Everyone assumes that they're going to win. The Chiefs jumped out to a huge lead, and we were thought, wow, the Chiefs are going to be in the playoffs. It was 17-0. The Raiders blocked a punt to make it 17-7. And you know how sometimes those things can change the course of a game. I think once we tied it up is when they began to realize, oh, it's not going to be an easy game. And by that time, it was too late. After mounting a monumental comeback, Chiefs kicker Pete Stojanovic missed a game-winning 44-yard field goal at the end of regulation. The game now into overtime. We had sucked all the momentum out of the stadium. They weren't making as much noise as we were. I remember Rich coming in the huddle one time and saying, you know what, we got them. We got them pinned up against the wall. Now let's break their backs. Let's shut this crowd up and go home victorious. And that's what happened. It was a big win for the Raiders. They kind of stuck it to the Chiefs and they kept the Chiefs out of the playoffs that year. It was bad enough to lose that game no matter who they were playing. And then to lose it to a team that they always beat, to a hated rival, it was uh, just another twist of the night. This rivalry, particularly in recent years, has been filled with games like that. 
In 2002, Gannon led the Raiders back to the Super Bowl. They lost to Tampa Bay, but Gannon was named league MVP. Rich Gannon won the MVP award by dominating Kansas City the year he won that award. There were times that Rich took games in his own hands and won games for our football team. And, and that's what you expect from your quarterback. That's what you ask for your quarterback. Rich finishing his career in Oakland made him a legend. With every new fall in the NFL comes new hope, new faces, new contenders, and new struggles to face on the road to the Super Bowl. But one thing will always remain a constant. Two times a year, 40 years of pent-up hostility and jealousy and contempt will pour out onto the field for 60 minutes of KC Oakland mayhem. It's always been heated and it's always two games that you look for to every single season. No matter what the records are, no matter how big the game is, no matter who's in first place, it's just always something that satisfies like, like beating the Raiders. Maybe to people on the outside who aren't paying a lot of attention, they might say, well, you know what, this rivalry isn't what it used to be. But to those players on the field, I guarantee it is.